Yeah, let's start. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. This is Spec and Tech number 55 and the last uh, event for this season uh, before we go on holiday for just the month of August and then we'll be back. Um, so I'm Michele, welcome. This is Franz. Uh, let's start by going through what is Spec and Tech for the people who are here for the first time. Actually, if you're here for the first time, can you raise your hand? Uh, only a few. Very few okay, ones. So uh, incredible. Lots of, lots of veterans. These are the hardcores coming in July. <laughs> Amazing. <Yeah>. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> exactly. So this is a picture from uh, our, our last retreat. Uh, we can think uh, of it as the core of our community. Those who come in the mountains with us for, uh, for a few days. But there's maybe more about that later. Uh, anyway, Spec and Tech is a tech community of, uh, of Trentino. It started in 2016. And the first events, uh, not many people, but uh, then we picked up some speed. And, and then we went up to more than 300 people uh, last April uh, at the university with uh, Professor Andreas Tannenbaum, legend of computer science. Uh, so yeah, we do events uh, every month, uh, like this one. Uh, and yeah, we talk about cool stuff, uh, and then we eat uh, uh, spec and drink beer together. Uh, so, a couple more pictures from the last event. We also have other things apart from the monthly events. For example, we have Spec and Track, which is uh, this uh, initiative where we uh, go hiking in the mountains. Uh, and then uh, there is someone uh, talking about some cool topic, uh, and there's an open discussion. The last one was uh, actually last week uh, above uh, Lago di Molveno. It was quite impressive, I have to say. Both the hike with a terrific view, and those are the topics we were talking about. Uh, um, uh, image generation via uh, machine learning models and uh, generative AI, generative AI, and AI all that, et cetera. Uh, so cool. Uh, there was a, an, a two hours discussion after the track with a beer in front of us. It was amazing. Have to that. Yeah, it's a more, uh, as you can see, the numbers are smaller and there's more room for discussion. We will be back with the spec and track as well in September, October, whenever we are back uh, yep. with the season. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So this is number our event number 55, or the regular series, let's say. Um, the topic is boost my browser, uh, because the, what the two talks have in common is something to do uh, client-side code that is executed in your browser, ma mainly. Uh, the two speakers for tonight are Jelle Ackerman. Uh, and uh, A warm applause. A warm applause. Uh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Coming from the Netherlands, but actually from San Martino. Uh, also so uh, directly from the Netherlands. Uh, yeah. or, I would say, yeah, from the Netherlands uh, with a detour from Berlin. Yeah. Yeah. All over. And, uh, and then Julio Zauza. <laughs> Warm applause for him, too. From, from, from Venezia with a detour from uh, uh, Austria, we would say. Yeah. So, yeah. so very international speakers. Tonight. Very international speakers tonight. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you will uh, hear a lot more from them uh, later. Uh, as usual, the format is two talks of half an hour, and then there is a networking session. And now, uh, a few more words from Francesco. Yeah, a few, very few more words. Uh, we're going to have Spec and Beers, the, the, the beers especially, those that will um, alleviate our heat, uh, are coming straight from the freezer. So. There will be very cold tonight. We managed to, thanks to Federico, like our superstar, uh, he deserves an applause. <laughs> we, we literally asked uh, on, uh, on Tuesday, okay, do we have a fridge for the beers for, for the event? And he fucking does. And yeah, yeah, of course yeah. he has. He has a fridge. And, and you, wa you want to have a Federico in your life, uh, the trust us. Uh, yeah. He's the one, you know, like he gets everything out of the pocket. So there is a way that you can support us, and we have our terrific t shirts. I have to buy two. Can you reserve two, two L? Grazie. Um, actually, you, you can get one, uh, also two if you like. Um, and these t the, this, uh, t shirts are actually helping us as an association to survive and also to do more things. We don't earn much. It's like three euros for every t-shirt we sell. But it's enough uh, for making more. And this year we made 120 t-shirts. Last year there were 80. So uh, next year we will make uh, 1,000. So uh, get ready. But also we have like free gadgets and uh, swag, whatever you like. You find it there at the desk. You can give a donation in any way you like via Satispay, via some app, uh, via your phone, uh, via your pocket, uh, via your grandmother as well. Um, if you go to our website, there are our events uh, with everything you 
are interested in, you can also be one of the people either supporting Spec and Tech as a sponsor or su su um, suggesting a talk. Julio sent us a message last December, last uh, February. No way. Ah, okay, bon, like it. <laughs> uh, a few months ago, actually. Uh, he sent us a message a few months ago, and he was like, yeah, I want to give a talk at Spec and Tech. And we're like, yeah, hold on. Seven years later. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, if you want to give a talk at Spec and Tech, we put it there. We have uh, a, a board on Trello with uh, hundreds of potential speakers. And if we find the perfect match, uh, we make an event. And that's uh, the night, actually. So you can also su uh, suggest to give a talk at Spec and Tech. You can find jobs uh, on our web portal. There are jobs that are curated by Trattino Sviluppo. There are jobs that are sponsored by the companies giving a talk or sponsoring Spec and Tech. And you can find everything there. Stay tuned on our social media, especially because we will launch very soon the retreat. And uh, at the end of the night, it seems fucking boring, but we send out a form and we read every single form for your feedback. And some people were saying it's hot in the room. We put the AC this time. Last time, nobody complained. And we put, uh, put it off this time. So that's why it's hot. Um, <laughs> I'm joking, of no, course. No, no, it's on. Uh, it's working, but... Uh, yeah, it's not it's working as the other times. It's, uh, it's uh, going on holiday as well. It's um, like 40 degrees outside. Exactly. Um, if you go on slide.do slash spec55, this is the magic code that will open the doors uh, for giving the feedback and asking the questions to the two speakers of the night. Uh, so we will share it later as well, but slide.do spec55, and you can ask questions. And I think we are ready to start with the first speaker of the night, Yel Ackerman. Welcome on stage. <laughs> now you see we're going to have this moment where we cross the fingers and we hope everything is working. And you're going to say, whoa, 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 you know. <laughs> Pray to the gods <laughs> of HDMI. Of <laughs> hey, it feels like coming back in the days, yeah? It works. Hey. hey. You don't need it, right? Now it is. Good. Oh, thank God the projector gods were among us. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, you came through the heat here um, to have your brain fried even more. Deep respect for you. Um, I'm Jelle. I am Dutch, but for the last 10 years I've been living in Berlin and then ended up here because of mountains. And um, I've been working a pitch for five years. Um, and I've been doing closure script for 10 years. Um, what is Pitch? Pitch is a presentation design tool. Uh, we help around like a million teams to make beautiful slides like these. Um, for like 120 people, it's all in closure script, hence um, tonight. And uh, yeah, the founders are former Wunderlist, and uh, yeah. It kind of looks like this. It's an editor. You can uh, you can pick beautiful templates. You can you can do all sorts of uh, great things together with your colleagues, and uh, you can use it to make pitch decks, sales proposals, uh, meetings, um, talks for meetups. Um, you can do whatever. So, but tonight we're talking about Closure Script. Um, who has heard of Closure Script here? Okay, good. I'm not gonna tell. <laughs> From uh, good, um, closure script is kind of an odd one. It's um, it's a dialect of closure. Who knows closure? Okay, a couple of more hands. So closure is this Lisp which compiles to Java. It runs on top of the JVM. Closure. It's exactly the same syntax, but it compiles to JavaScript. So it runs in the browser, it runs on the back end on Node.js, it runs on mobile, React Native, it even runs on some embedded platforms which run JavaScript. But it's functional. It's a functional programming language. And what does that mean? We'll get into that. But like, don't imagine like this academic like uh, programming language. It's not like Haskell or, or whatever. It's very practical in its core. And um, 
and really suitable for like real world problems, as we'll see in a bit. It's compatible with Clojure, so you can run, if you have a Java backend, you can easily share business logic uh, with your front end as well. It's used by quite some companies. Uh, some use it like uh, in, for the whole stack, like New Bank, like the biggest bank in Latin America. Um, and then some others like for services, for microservices and stuff. Um, so it's, it's, used, it's used out, it's used for real world problems. And tonight we're gonna solve like a real world problem. I've been having since moving to Toronto. Who who else is who else is dealing with this problem? Yeah. <laughs> so I moved here, and in Berlin we have like three bins. Um, here there are five. I'm like okay, um, and they're being picked up at like all the different days, and like I was like, it's like this is very complex. Um, we need to do something about this. So um, let's let's try to solve this problem with Closure Script, since it's such a great language to solve real world problems. So uh, let's see, is this visible in the back? Yeah, good. Um, so what we have here is a just a bit of data. Just to get started, let's define some data. So this is that same calendar, whatever, but like written out in code. So um, we have a hash map. Um, as you see, paper, glass, residue, plastic, organic, those are the keys in the hash map. So a hash map is like an object, like a dictionary, um, and these are the keys. And they're actually keywords. They're special. I wouldn't say variables, but they're special. Um, they have special meaning in terms that you can reuse them. They're unique and they're they're shared. We'll get into them later. The values in this hash map um, have also hash maps. So these are nested, and uh, they have the keys collected with a boolean false, um, and they have a day with a vector, which is like an array or list. Uh, with the days, so, and we give it a name, uh, trash calendar. Is it better? Okay, it's the same. <laughs> so, we have defined our trash calendar. So, now let's do something with it. So, this is a function in Clojure. As you see, it's a lot of parentheses. That's Clojure. It comes from a Lisp, and that's all we have. Parentheses are friends, and um, so what we have here. Let's on, on line 19. We have uh, we call the function which we defined before it. So which trash on which day? So we want to figure out the trash on Thursday, and that's glass, residue, and organic. So here we have specified the function. So this is the function signature. This is the name. Uh, this is a doc string, so you can like have inline documentation. It's very useful when you're actually using it. Your 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 editor will just like give you the descriptions. Uh, this is what on line 13 is like the argument for the function, and then we have the logic on like getting all the um, all the types of trash per day. So keep is just some sort of map. So we're mapping over the over the list. Okay. A bit of syntax. Syntax is is all fun and games, but like in the end, it's about like the the, the paradigms behind the programming language, right? So we want to learn something new. Like every time I'm learning a programming language, you kind of want to get to know like what is this good at and like uh, what are the paradigms involved. So item potency. Uh, item potency is um, comes from Latin. Item potent same power, like having the same power. And um, it's, it's a, I think it's an important concept, not just for closure, but I think it's for every programming language if you want to write predictable code. So, bit of JavaScript. 
Um, this is not idempotent. Does anyone know why? Because b actually can change. So if b changes, this function actually doesn't return what you normally expect. Um, b lives outside of, uh, uh, of the function. So um, if b now is 11 and I add 1, it's all of a sudden 12 instead of 11. And makes it kind of shaky. It's like if you don't know, if, if the function doesn't give you back the same every time you use it, it's kind of shaky. Um, here's, here's a tiny bit of closure script. Um, you can do the same in JavaScript. It's just I wanted to show you some more closure script tonight. Um, and we have the same function add, but here we have it all encapsulated. We give both, um, both arguments A and B, and we add it up. So this is idempotent. You can write idempotent code in JavaScript as well, but closure script makes it really easy because of immutability. So immutability, uh, that was some Dutch, um, means um, things which are not changing, so unchangeable. And um, so here is the trash calendar we previously defined. So the trash calendar, paper collected falls, day Monday. So still the same as before. But now, on line four, we're going to associate in the trash calendar paper collected is true. So the paper got collected. And as you see, on line five, it returns paper is now collected. On line seven, we call it again. We, we inspect what is inside of trash calendar. And on line eight, we see, huh, collected is false. It didn't change it. Um, and so this is the big difference. This is a persistent data structure. Uh, it's immutable because it's not changing. It never changes. We define the trash calendar once, and then what we can do is like using these data functions on top of it, but it just returns a new copy. Always copy, don't overwrite. And this makes things idempotent um, as well. Okay. Another concept. Taking a sip because this is so hard to pronounce. Uh, homo iconicity is uh, um, is beautiful. Um, this is very Lisp um, specific because everything you write in a Lisp is also data. Like Lisp itself is lists and lists and lists. Um, that's why it's called Lisp as well. That's the Lisp programming language. Um, and this is beautiful because that means that things like meta programming, like write, writing macros, a program which rewrites itself. You don't do it often, but when you need it, it's really great. Um, but another side effect of homo iconicity in a programming language, for me, is structural editing. And um, it looks a bit like this. Um, so this is um, a small screen grab from Calva. Uh, in VS Code, it's a closure plugin, and it allows you to basically push code back and forward, like around, as if it's water. It's like fluid. It's 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 really great. Once you get used to it, being able to just shove things around like blocks, um, it's like Lego. Um, so this is Slurp. Um, um, when you when you slurp things into your list, um, there's also barfing. That's uh, when you barf things out of your list. I didn't come up with the names. Um, I think it's amazing. <laughs> um, OK, something else um, Closure Script does really well is uh, interop, um, because both Clojure and Closure Script are on top of other languages, Java and JavaScript. Um, having this good connection with your host is very important. and. Um, Something which, which is in the definition of interop is um, 
is that it's uh, reciprocated, so that you not only use from the JavaScript ecosystem, but that you can also provide back. Um, so everything you write in ClojureScript, you can also use in JavaScript. You can call the functions, you can do whatever. Um, actual fun fact is that um, immutable JS, which is very common in the React ecosystem, was actually ClojureScript before. Um, the data structures, the immutable data structures, were packed up, exported to JavaScript, and uh, exposed as a library called Mori.js, which then later became Immutable.js. Um, so we can use um, JavaScript as we like. This is the new ECMA specification for dates. It's called temporal. Um, and um, so it's quite a, quite a bit function, but um, bear with me. Uh, on line 12, we actually um, we make today like JS, so this is the namespace um, where we grab into the JavaScript world and we, we generate a now timestamp. This we then pass to our function, our new function which we specify here, what to take out tonight. Because what's so great about this trash calendar is that like I don't actually care like which day it's collected, it's like what day do I need to actually take it out and put it on the street, right? So, um, yeah, we're, um, we're basically reusing the function we, we did earlier, which trash on which day, but we make it count for tomorrow. So, by today, we add one day, and then we basically figure out what day, what trash do I need to pick up today to have it picked up tomorrow. Okay, so this is using just regular JavaScript um, with a bit of a funky syntax. Um, okay, um, interactive programming is, uh, is cool because it allows you to do, um, I'm gonna show this in a second. Like I'm gonna do a little live coding session with y'all and um, we have, in my case, the edits are VS Code, but if you use Vim or Emacs or whatever, they're closure plugins for all these browsers, uh, editors, which then connect with your browser, with your runtime, or with your backend, that's also possible. You can just like um, connect it all and uh, be able to interact interactively, kind of like a Python notebook, uh, but in your own editor, your own trusted editor, you can like, uh, mess around with the state of your program. I'll show it in a second, because we're gonna solve another problem. Now we know when to take the trash out, we still need to figure out like what, what goes in what bin, right? Like um, for me, this whole packaging bin with like all sorts of weird rules got me confused um, and so let's, let's, let's write a function which Make sure that we put the things in the right place, okay? We're gonna use closure spec for this. That's spec without the K, without the animal cruelty. Um, so it, spec is a library which is, um, uh, it's, it's officially supported by closure uh, by the main team and it's, uh, it's beautiful because Closure itself is a dynamic programming language. It's not statically typed. Um, but this allows you to get really close to static types and even go further, um, um, which I'll show you in a second. So let's take a look. Um, is this visible? Yes, awesome. OK. Um, I have a version of our app running here um, as a local dev environment. It's our, our, um, um, our runtime. So uh, what we can do is I have, this is VS Code, I have VS Code connected with that runtime. Um, what I can do is I can start evaluating things. So this JavaScript alert, uh, I can fire off, and then we have that in, in our 
in our browser. So this works because I have it set up on localhost. You can even do this in production if you want, can't recommend, but it's possible. You can do it if you have Re React Native. You can have the same connection with your phone. I've used that a lot. It's awesome. Um, so you can throw things to the browser, but um, you can also um, introspect what is going on. So in this case, we can actually see the whole application state of what's going on in this really complex app. Uh, so here's just a subset of the state, and like we can kind of see what's going on under the hood of our app. Um, this is so useful because now I can start, I can grab this state, write some other business logic on top, and actually get a feel for it. So here's our trusted uh, trash calendar. We can evaluate it, and it gets added to the spec and tech namespace. Um, here's the function we've pre previously written, and now we can actually see if it works or not. So which trash on day? Okay, Monday is paper and organic. Wednesday, nothing. Thursday, these three. Okay, but we want to take it a step further. We want to figure out what to put in which bin. So. I pulled this through Google Translate, um, and these are the allowed trash types within the packaging bin. So let's figure out the packaging bin. So in this, like, they're all keywords, um, as you see here. So plastic bottle, flask, plastic container, and I've put them in a set. Um, this is just a list with unique items. And what we then do is we, um, we start writing this definition, which is a specification. The specification uh, allows us to, it's a, it's a closure spec thing, where um, we specify what is allowed. Um, and so here, uh, we reuse this, this, this bit of data. We also say it should always be a keyword. And with that, we can validate, like, OK, um, we reuse the trash packaging type, and we see if it's valid. So this is a closure thing, a uh, closure spec thing. And we see that plastic bottles are allowed. Are toys allowed? No, toys are not allowed. Um, we can even ask it to explain, like, why are toys not allowed? Um, so let's see. Um, Toys, oh, this is really small. Uh, toys are not allowed because it's not in the list. Um, if I pass it a random string, um, it will tell because it's not a keyword. OK, this seems very simple, this example. But if you have like a really big hash map, if you have like your complete application state, you can basically validate whether your application state is allowed or not. So let's make the bin. The bin takes three, three units, three flasks, three toys, whatever. Oh no, toys were not allowed. Um, and we basically say it can be a collection of these types, which we previously defined. It can be a maximum of 30, and it's a vector. So let's evaluate this. Here, we make the bin itself, and we initialize it empty. So now we can actually see, OK, it's empty. This is our type. Let's look at it. OK, it works. It's valid. Although it's empty, there's nothing in there. It still validates. So now let's make a function where we can actually put stuff in the trash. So what's cool here is that same function definition. We add an exclamation mark because this is dangerous. We're changing things here. We're changing this, this thing. That's why it also has an exclamation mark. Um, and um, so that's what's happening here. On line 71, we're conjing, we're conjugating uh, the trash into the bin. But before that, we have these two lines where we can completely type check and even check is the bin is full or not um, using pre, so what is being put into the function, 
um, using this check of, hey, is it a toy? No, the function will not work. Um, is it a plastic bottle? Yeah, go ahead, put it in the trash. And then we also tested on the way out. Um, is it overflowing the bin? Is it not, et cetera. Okay, so our bin already has some things in there, and so we can add even more flasks or whatever in there. Uh, toys, no, still, it's not allowed. So you're not allowed to throw toys into the packaging bin. Um, what's great is that you can not only use this to validate, but you can also use it to generate and to do generative testing. So what we can do is generate all sorts of packaging types, stuff it into uh, the trash, and see whether it fails or not. So using this specification, you actually test your functions, input and output. OK. Um, that was the little live coding session. So why did we pick this this strange programming language? Like it's 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 um, it's not a it's not a very um, common choice for startups, and especially for startups which are quite ambitious and like like to to pick something so niche, right? So. Clojure was previously used by the team at Wunderlist. They had a couple of microservices in Clojure, and they discovered that it's actually like, wow, there's something there. It's very interesting. And um, when when the CTO started thinking of like, okay, pooh, we're gonna build this like really big editor, like very complex things changing constantly. It's like we need we need something proper to deal with all that state. Um, and so he w he was like, okay, I think Closure Script might be a great fit for this. Um, also, the whole thing of like having we have a web application, we have a desktop application with Electron, we have a React Native application. So we have all these um, different targets we we want to address as well. Closure Script ticks that box as well. Closure script is very performant. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and we wanted to have things collaborative from the start. Everything needs to be real time in sync. And because of these persistent data structures, it's really easy to check, hey, is the, what the other person have, is that aligned with what I have? So we can do equality checks really quickly. So five years. Um, after having made the choice of Closure Script, so we're, we've been doing this for five years now. Uh, we have about like half a million lines of code, um, and I think this is this is pretty interesting because um, like twenty percent, like so sixty three percent is front end code. Like it's very front end heavy the application, and seventeen percent of that business logic is also shared with the back end. Um, and the back end is just 20%. Um, this is because we, we have this really simple API with like a graph uh, kind of setup, and, and that works really well. So to, to kind of summarize, um, because of immutability, because of like these native immutable data structures, we like things are idempotent, things are very dry without side effects. Uh, that makes things really predictable, and because of that predictability, we have like high maintainability. Um, because of the whole structural editing, the REPL, hot reloading, being able to still use JavaScript libraries, um, we have like really quick feedback loops, um, and that means that we get a lot of shit done. Um, so behind the scenes of Closure Script, behind the compiler, sits the Google Closure compiler. It's Closure with an S, and it shakes the tree in the end and makes sure that all the dead code falls out, and that all the code is being optimized um, like crazy. Like the reason, like Gmail. 
And all these products like work so well is because of the Google Closure compiler because it makes things instantly more performant. So we we leverage that a lot, um, especially like um, with persistent data structures where you have this memory overhead of like always making copies. It's great to have like um, this extra performance boost. But and I think this is a kind of a Strange, strange one. Because so little people are doing closure, we decided that we want to have closure as our hi hiring strategy. Because people who know closure are often like senior engineers, and they're looking for a new challenge. And um, that way, we were ma we managed to hire a lot of like really experienced people because. Um, Maybe they didn't even know closure itself. As you see, the syntax is really like like um, like thin. Like there's n there's not much there to learn. Um, we could onboard um, people who are curious about closure or who've always wanted to work in closure um, um, to our to our team. Um, and. Um, one thing I forgot to tell is that uh, last year, um, the the Stack Overflow survey elected Clojure as the third most loved language, and um, the best paid language. So it's it's uh, it's 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 very interesting. So the uh, having it as a hiring strategy to pick a niche language. Uh, which people are enthusiastic about is uh, is definitely something I can recommend. Um, here's some quotes from colleagues. Um, Paulus um, uh, told me to mention that, like, um, in um, in relationship to like the JavaScript ecosystem, where everything always changes, like people crank out new libraries like every day. Um, there's always something new to try. This is not the case in Closure Scripts. The, the language itself, only new things are being added once in a while. Nothing ever changes, nothing ever breaks. It's um, my projects from 10 years ago, I can get up and running in like seconds. And um, simply because there's a strict culture of don't change things, just like the data structures don't change things. Always just um, just add carefully. Um, okay, I'll um, I'll make it quick. Um, if you decide to give it a try, there's some some cool starting points. We use React. There's an amazing React wrapper. Um, it uh, uses hiccup syntax. Here's like a um, a little snippet. It, uh, it uses data uh, to specify the HTML tree. So h1 is just a keyword and a vector. Uh, diff dot example clock is just a diff with a class example clock um, and the property style, uh, whatever in a hash map. And so what's great about this is that it's not a string. Like in React, you might be used to JSX, which is just string concatenation, right? Uh, this is data. You can treat it as data, and you can like um, like mess around with it really easily. Um, it composes like functions, so like the components themselves are just functions, uh, no classes, no no nothing like that. Um, there's an interesting closure database. It's uh, by the official closure team. Um, it also has the same thing of having your queries as data. Um, this is great because it composes well, um, unlike SQL, which is a string concatenation again. Um, if you want to do more complex things, uh, you can take things apart, weave them together. Um, Reframe is an interesting one. It's state management for React, and it's it's cool because it, it actually inspired Redux. Um, so it's it's quite old by now. It has amazing documentation. Even if you're not going to use ClojureScript, I can recommend reading the documentation because you'll get you'll become 
like a better front end engineer um, because it talks about like the most intricate complex state cases and how to deal with it. Okay, um, I'm through it. I can really recommend watching Rich Hickey's keynotes. Uh, the maker of Clojure is an excellent uh, public speaker, and uh, he talks about a lot of like philosophical um, engineering issues. Um, we have a couple of blog posts about how we use Clojure at Pitch. Um, I think this is being shared afterwards. Um, yeah, good. Um, so some extra links for you all to check out at home. Um, I brought some stickers. They're all on the table. Unfortunately, I have none of these cool t-shirts with me. Um, but um, yeah, that's it. Um, any questions? I immediately got some stickers that are really cool, I can just tell. So head over to the, um, to the table up there. Uh, questions can be asked on the on the link, but we can take a. You can just go to slide.do slash spec55, and you can also grab uh, and upvote the questions from others. So, first question: um, Since okay, you have to bear with me because last time I wrote a piece of uh, a functional code, it was 2011, and it was all camo. So yeah. Ooh. Since subjects are immutable in closure, do the continuous copies make the runtime slow? said uh, it was quite performant, no? It is very performant because it shares. They're, they're persistent, um, but they share roots. So it doesn't take memory that way. Um, so no, it's, oh. uh, I've never had problems. Okay. I think if you do like, um, say, like really, um, where, you, where you need the performance, like you're making a, a um, you're doing some insane graphics, like what you're doing. Like probably, like the the the, the immutable data structures slow you down. Okay, uh, Alpern is closure script to introduce security vulnerabilities from a scale from one to PHP. <laughs> <laughs> um, our security team is very happy that we have closure script um, because it. Uh, that's a lot of obscurity. No, I'm kidding. No, it's it's it doesn't add more vulnerabilities than. Okay, okay. And, and what was the learning curve of uh, Closure Script compared to other languages, functional or not? The learning curve. Yeah. Oh, um, it's uh, in relation to other. Yeah, other languages. Other languages. Uh, okay. Um, be it functional or not. So f I think it's funny that if you're an experienced engineer. Um, it might actually be more difficult than for someone starting to learn how to programming because you need to unlearn a lot of things. You need to unlearn all the object oriented stuff. You need to, because that doesn't exist. Like that's, um, you don't use that. Um, I've uh, organized uh, workshops uh, for um, women and femme presenting uh, people to learn closure and we've successfully like taught closure to a lot of people simply because we could skip uh, all the object oriented stuff and um, um, there are not many concepts to it like it's a, it's kind of like a weird way of thinking the functional programming paradigm but it's um, this there's very little syntax so that like during the workshop it's two days like like the first half of the first day would be like kind of a syntax kind of like challenge to get that um, known to people and then it's just having fun with playing with APIs and like doing stuff so i'd say for beginners it's uh, it's fine okay you know? a couple of two more questions um isn't this culture of not changing things otherwise they're going to break uh, preventing the language to evolve very good question yeah. so um, I that. It's I actually I I think it's really easy to if you don't like something in Clojure you can change it because you can write a macro and you can just override the internal functionality of the programming language if you want. Um, 
Closure spec was added recently. There are some other official libraries which are just libraries, right? Like in a Lisp, you don't actually have to change core stuff. Yeah, you might disagree with the core team, like, oh, I think uh, this specific function should be in the core, but you just make your own library and you just collect your favorite features, uh, functions. Um, if you want syntactical sugar for something, there, there, um, there are tags which you can use, uh, and so you can extend the language yourself. So, no. Got it. All right. Um, there are a few more questions. Final one. Um, oh fuck, there was one. Yeah. Do the crew of Peach have a death metal band? Please, can you explain your T-shirt? Yes, we actually have. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Insane. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, we're g you might be the guest star of our radio. I, I, I didn't <laughs> ask for the audio and the, the, okay. the thing, otherwise I you, would have played you. it. Lucky. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for your talk. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so, there are a few more questions from the audience. You can just ask Yell uh, at the end of the talk, uh, at the end of the night, in front of a beer or in front of a glass of. Uh, whatever non-alcoholic is there, which is full. Um, I have one more thing to show you, which is Kay. real quick. Okay, you can go there to our Phonico to get this get thing removed. And maybe we can also get this uh, away, Pitta. Okay. Um, 40 seconds of your time, because we have something to show you. Probably some of you have seen it, but I think it's always worth okay, fail. Pompiamo di nuovo, eh? Dai. Take me home, take me on a ride. I, I got a good feeling about the colors lighting up your eyes. Take me home, take me to the sky. I, I got a good feeling. Tell me the only thing you are is mine. Take me home, take me on a ride. I, I got a good feeling about the colors lighting up your eyes. Take me home, take me to the sky. I, I got a good Okay, not much to add, honestly. Um, apart that we got the dates set. The retreat V4, our fourth edition of the retreat is gonna be from the 6th to the 8th of October. And uh, the tickets uh, got open very silently on our channels, if you didn't see it. We have 50 seats guaranteed. I'm joking, There's a, there are only 30 left. If you're a real speaker, you should be there. No, I'm not gonna tell you to buy it now, but uh, you're here. But uh, when you come back uh, in at home at around midnight 30, you can get it. Um, it's a great piece of advice that I'm giving you because it's uh, the event of the community. It's gonna be three days from Friday till Sunday, 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. So you don't have to take holidays from your work, no worries. Um, we're gonna go up. Enjoy food, enjoy spa, enjoy sauna, enjoy uh, board games, uh, okay, talks, workshops, outdoor sports as well. This, gonna, this year we're gonna do it in October because we're gonna have tarzaning, trekking, uh, a number of other things like uh, uh, downhill, and even select whatever you like. And it sounds incredible, but uh, if you're a professional, it's 160 euros for two nights, bed in a quadruple room. The, trip to Dimaro, back and forth, two dinners, two lunches, two breakfast, uh, food, in drinks included uh, at lunch, and the dinner, and the breakfast, the wellness area, and the limited fun, plus our brand gadgets from the retreat. And it's funny, but if you're a student, it's even cheaper. It's 120, we have 20 seats for students. Uh, last year, they got sold in 24 hours, I'm gonna tell you. We're gonna promote it very heavily from tomorrow. So you got some advance uh, if you get it tonight. Uh, I'll, we're gonna be waiting for you, okay? Retreat V4 from 6th till 8th of October. You buy it now and then you forget for two months. Thanks a lot. Second talk of the night, uh, Julio Thousa on stage.
Uh, hello everyone. Um, today I wanted to talk to you about uh, give your web app superpowers using the power of your GPU. Yes, I should move a bit. Yeah. Oh, where? Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Um, let's start over. Um, my name is Giulio. I'm an Italian software engineer. Recently, I've moved to Austria. Uh, that's my handle on the controversial bird uh, social network, if you want to look me up. And uh, in my career, I always build tools for engineers to make their life easier, let's say. And I always worked uh, with uh, web technologies. And I personally think that GPUs are pretty cool. Uh, I think that like most of the people here own one. If you don't own one, you have one in your phone. If you don't have a phone, your grandma phone has one. So they're pretty much everywhere. And uh, how many people here do play video games? Like raise your hand. A lot of people. And uh, yeah, we can agree that uh, if you're now enjoying uh, graphics, like those, uh, it's because of GPUs under the hood uh, that are getting hot and raising up to 80 degrees, just to show you that uh, uh, that meme of can it run crisis. And, uh, but that's not like the only thing that they're for nowadays. If you are doing stuff in a browser, if you're doing uh, 2D animations, it's very likely that uh, you're using your GPU under the hood. In fact, the uh, Chrome browser internally uses an uh, accelerated uh, vector graphics library called Skia that uh, uh, it uses the GPU to make those animation possible. If you're seeing all those cool things in, uh, in web application, it's because it, Chrome it's working hard to use your graphics processor to animate all those things. And uh, because in fact, like GPUs are inherently better to do this kind of stuff compared to uh, CPUs because like, instead of having one single core that is very powerful and can do much many different things, instead uh, they have uh, uh, like 1,024 teeny tiny cores that are very specialized in what they do. And like they're really limited. Sometimes even uh, uh, the entire graphics card uh, is uh, step locked. That means that uh, it's not that it can branch uh, with an if statement, but everything has to execute the same piece of code at the same time. So like they're different to program uh, and uh, they are a bit more complicated, but they are extremely powerful to take a lot of data and process it all at once. And in fact, like um, if you are doing machine learning stuff, you are probably using them because uh, people that were doing image recognition, like the problem of, uh, hey, is this a cat or is this a dog? Uh, at a certain point, they were using the CPUs and some guys on this paper discovered that, hey, if we do it with a uh, with GPU, we can um, do it with much bigger data sets. And we can finally recognize not only cats and dogs, but maybe also platypuses, which is cool. And in fact, on this paper, they said that uh, they took one operation called convolution and they made it way faster by using uh, matrix multipli multiplication on the GPU. And also probably if uh, you are on, uh, if you're <laughs> reading what is happening right now around the world, you're, you heard about uh, JGPT, that is this new uh, anthropomorphic robot that it's able to uh, say things, uh, no, it's not true, but uh, if you really know what I'm talking about, that's powered by a lot of servers running very expensive GPUs. And uh, so that's another application for them. But uh, I think that like a lot of people here, maybe some of them are working in machine learning, uh, some are working in programming video games, but like if you have seen the title of this talk, uh, you probably work uh, on the web. You're probably uh, writing JavaScript sometimes. So. Okay, but I build websites. How does this affect me as a web developer? Well, um, thanks Mark Zuckerberg that uh, uh, some days ago I opened the main website of Threads, the new uh, bird app replacement, that uh, um, on their ma main website, they didn't have any fancy application on anything. They just added the title thread and a lot of teeny tiny spheres 
uh, rendering in 3D, with which you could interact with, that they made up the Threads logo. And uh, that's actually being done with uh, WebGL, that is a technology to um, uh, use the GPU on the web. So you can do uh, a lot of those cool demos for your website. But not only. Uh, if you open the uh, GitHub a few months ago, now they unfortunately changed it, there was this really cool animation that showed uh, the globe uh, and all around the world uh, who was interacting with GitHub at that point. And that's also done uh, with WebGL, with the same library called 3JS. And I think that it's like pretty cool to add those features to a website because it's not flat anymore. It's something that you can interact with and uh, I think just do cooler stuff. And uh, if instead uh, you saw the recent uh, uh, Apple keynotes, you probably saw the uh, new Apple VR classes called the um, uh, Vision Pro. And you can see how uh, they have a page in which uh, you can click on the different features of the Vision Pro. And uh, you can uh, rotate the Vision Pro and see uh, around uh, the, the Vision Pro how it's made. And when I looked at this, I was like, no way, that, that, that's a sequence of videos. That's surely like uh, a bunch of videos that transition between each other. Until I opened the Web Inspector, and I saw that that was a canvas powered by 3JS. And that looked insane, honestly. Like, I, that's a, just a 3D model with uh, a bunch of uh, very nicely made uh, materials. And they're just moving the camera around. So I think it's cool that even Apple is uh, doing this kind of stuff with using the GPU on the web. And it works pretty well on uh, a lot of computers, so that's also impressive. And uh, also, uh, if you heard of uh, Linear and everyone doing uh, uh, very cool uh, landing pages with, the, with blue and purplish color, also there is this other company called Vercel that uh, made that is very nice scroll animation that when you scroll down, you see a star field zooming in very fast uh, and blurring uh, synchronized to your, uh, to your scrolling. And that's that uh, star field that you see, it's actually done uh, with, a, um, with a cone 3D model, like a pyramid, uh, and you're just uh, moving the texture around it, like you're like in, into a sock. And uh, it's very cool. They also did uh, um, uh, a blog post in which they explained how they did it. And that's another thing that you can do on the GPU on the browser. But I think that those are like all cool demos that doesn't, don't really deliver value. Okay, they look cool, but uh, they don't do, you can't make a startup out of those. But you can make a startup out of this. Uh, this is an example of a startup called Google that made Google Maps, not a startup anim anymore. And if you, uh, if you ever zoomed around Google Maps and used the 3D view, um, you see that you can see the mountains in, uh, in 3D. And uh, that's using WebGL and the GPU on your browser. And actually, this technology is pretty involved because uh, like, those are textures that are being uh, downloaded and streamed from a server. The 3D models are all uh, loaded uh, in uh, chunks of uh, kilometer per kilometer, and they're being uh, uh, very quickly loaded and unloaded in different resolutions uh, to the GPU. And it's also able to draw very distant stuff uh, by reducing uh, its resolution so that uh, you are, if it's distance, you don't care about the much about the resolution. And it's also using some shader here to blue the stuff, like make the stuff that is distant more blue so that uh, it looks more realistic. But not only, there are a lot of tools like Onshape or Thinkercut Thinker that uh, use the uh, GPU on the web to provide productivity tools, such as uh, a CAD editor on the browser. Or uh, you probably heard of or used the Figma, that uh, it's a very cool uh, uh, graphics editor and prototyping tool for the, um, for the browser that internally uses a lot of WebGL, like everything that you see in this canvas, it's, uh, cast it's uh, custom rendered. And in fact, internally, uh, it's built with React and with C++ uh, using WebAssembly and WebGL. 
and they have a 2D uh, GPU powered uh, multi resolution, uh, multi level tile based rendering. What does it mean? It means that uh, everything that you see here is uh, rendered, and then when you zoom in, uh, it still shows you the lower resolution version, and then it progressively rendered the higher resolution version. You can probably see it here. Let's zoom in, lower resolution, and slowly it renders the, the better one. And there is a lot of code, a lot of C++ code involved in doing something like this. And I think it's pretty cool. Uh, they built uh, at something that works amazingly well, and that I think uh, doing that on a browser, it's really uh, an engineering challenge. And, uh, but now let's talk uh, uh, about what I'm doing. I'm um, building this uh, uh, product called Flux that uh, it's very similar to Figma, but uh, it's basically Figma, but for PCBs, for printed, printed circuit boards, for uh, electronic circuits. And uh, you can collaborate online on the browser just by sharing a link. And uh, you can see that you can uh, see your board in 3D, you can uh, add comments, and then you can edit in 2D all the wires and connect them together. Like you see that there is a lot of stuff going on here. Like there are a lot of uh, very different shapes uh, that are rendered uh, very fast. And then we also have the, the, the 3D view with which you can uh, then see how your, uh, mo your thing that you're building is going to look. And then uh, you can send it off to manufacturing. And uh, um, by building that, we had a lot of challenges, and we currently still have, because uh, uh, we are rendering uh, giant documents that have thousands of different parts, and each part can be made up by different sh 2D shapes and 3D ones, so it's like, very complicated to handle all the stuff in memory. And the entire document can be zoomed out and, and viewed at as once, like uh, when you zoom out on Google Maps and you can see the entire world, uh, so you need to have a, an efficient representation from that. We have an always running uh, circuit simulator in the background that is also taking up memory and processing power. And uh, we also not only need to um, run the simulation and the rendering, but also to calculate as they're having interaction a lot of uh, uh, electrical properties such as conductivity. And it's collaborative real-time multiplayer so that multiple users can work on the same document. And uh, everything uh, has to run at 60 frames per second, uh, even on medium hand hardware, which is extremely challenging. And uh, that's something that we're still working on. And uh, the technology that all those stuff, that all those things that I showed you so far is um, called WebGL that it's an API for the browser that is actually quite old. Like it was uh, um, drafted out uh, and I think even released the first time in 2011, which is 12 years ago. And uh, a lot of things changed in the meantime. But the idea is that it's based uh, on uh, a technology that uh, was invented, I think, in the 80s by Silicon Graphics. If you've uh, ever seen the Jurassic Park movies, you probably have seen uh, those giant uh, Silicon Graphics workstation around. And uh, the idea is that it works with uh, a thing called a pipeline, with which you, uh, you start by uh, loading uh, geometry data on the GPU. And then uh, you can uh, customize some parts of this uh, OpenGL pipeline and uh, like customize how stuff should look in your screen, which color should be applied, which textures. And uh, you go to the primitive processing, rasterization, vertex processing, fragment processing, and then uh, when it's finished, it gets pushed out to your uh, browser window. You start initially by uploading uh, what is called vertex data because since a uh, 3D model is made up by a, a bunch of points in 3D space, you need to represent them in memory. And you can customize a lot on uh, how those are represented in memory. Uh, you can even add custom ab attributes if you want. And uh, once that uh, is being uh, up is uploaded to the GPU, then uh, uh, you can say, okay, GPU, I give you this data. Now I can teach you what you can do with this data. And the way that you can do that, it's by programming uh, some very small programs that are called shaders. Shaders are uh, a way to customize how the GPU works. 
The point is that like originally the old, very old GPUs from the 90s, from the beginning of the 2000s, were called uh, fixed function. Like uh, you, um, the, the GPU is especially made to uh, draw 3D stuff uh, and so simulate lighting uh, and stuff like that. But uh, you could just like dial in some parameters. You couldn't really uh, program them. Eventually, uh, like in around 2003, 2006, I think, that time span, uh, NVIDIA released uh, one of the first actual GPUs that were programmable. And users were finally able, to uh, coders were finally able to write programs that actually run the GPU to customize how they work. And the way that you can do that uh, in, uh, uh, in OpenGL, it's by using this programming language called GLSL, that if you see, it's very C++-like, uh, like if you program in a language like C++ or JavaScript, you're probably already familiar with it. And uh, um, you can use this with WebGL as well. You can uh, write those kind of code and uh, use it in the browser with WebGL. There are two kind of shader programs, one that it's called uh, Fragment Shader and one that is called Vertex Shader. Basically, this one uh, operates on every single 3D point whereas this one instead uh, operates on uh, every pixel that gets displayed on screen. What I already said. Uh, first, you have a, a 3D model that uh, gets processed by the vertex shader that you can write. And then uh, when it gets transformed to pixel, every pixel gets uh, tr uh, transformed by this uh, uh, fragment shader with which you can apply colors, you can apply textures, and stuff like that. So the idea is that, for example, with the vertex shader, you can take a plain 3D model that is just a bunch of points that are aligned and deform them, for example, to create an animation or to uh, follow a 3D uh, mathematical function. And uh, this is used, for example, for animation, for skinning, uh, but the real uh, stuff that the user customize is usually the fragment shader. Because if you can run uh, a program in parallel for each pixel, then you can use uh, uh, mathematics and physics to uh, calculate some physical properties of that pixel. Because, uh, for example, you can calcula calculate the light refraction. You can calculate uh, how the like how that thing should look. And with those, you can create a lot of very cool materials, such as reflective ones uh, or uh, ones with textures uh, and with lighting. And you can do uh, a lot of very cool looking uh, stuff with fragment shaders. So if you want to get started now on the web uh, with WebGL, honestly, I don't think you should write WebGL because it's very cumbersome, it's very daunting. Uh, instead, probably you, you want to use a library to do that. Uh, like the most famous one is 3.js, but there are alternatives. The cool thing about 3.js is that uh, if you know and like React, uh, there are bindings for it. Uh, with which you can create 3D scenes declaratively and reusing a lot of code. For example, this, uh, this very cool demo here, you can see how we have uh, uh, like the mouse cursor that can uh, deform a physical space. There is a, there is a physical uh, uh, simulator running. And you can see how there are the texture, there are the reflections, there are a lot of things going on. And you might wonder, well, this is probably a lot of line of codes. But it's not true, it's around like 60 lines of code, which I think it's pretty crazy. Like you can build uh, extremely complicated stuff in, uh, very, like very quickly. And uh, if you look at the documentation, like this binding is called React Tree Fiber, and uh, it's maintained by some really cool people. And uh, there are a lot of guides on how to actually do this kind of stuff, and it's very well documented. And there are some very cool examples like uh, this other one that uh, shows like uh, uh, an interactable scene with uh, a lot of uh, small displays. And uh, I think that that will make a very cool intro for your personal website. And that one as well, you can see how you start with a canvas React component, you can add a background color, you can have some lights, you can uh, uh, add uh, a mesh with uh, that is a plane, you can add material, so like it's very, I think uh, easy to read uh, and easy to update, especially if you're using React. And also you can make stuff that is like useful even for your, uh, for your company. For example, this one is a really cool uh, uh, customizer for the colors uh, and the styling of a t-shirt. 
and you can build your own, and uh, you can, I think that there are a lot of use cases for this, such as what we're doing with Flux, for example. And, uh, but like, you can use a library, it's cool. Um, it can bring you 80% there, but then there are some things that, uh, uh, if you're doing a big application with a lot of uh, stuff going on, like we're doing, you need to be mindful a bit of how GPU works and be able to uh, optimize stuff. One problem is this, the CPU, GPU bottleneck. Every time that you issue a command to your GPU, uh, you need to issue the command and then wait for it to respond. It's actually way more simple to give the GPU everything at once uh, instead of calling it multiple times. So if you have a, a single 3D model and you want to draw 10,000 uh, instances of it, if you naively just draw them in a for loop, it's going to be extremely inefficient uh, because basically we're uploading 40 megabytes of data uh, on the GPU. And you can see that like, if you do that uh, uh, with the same 3D model over and over, it's going to get like, quite slow. You're going to get like 33 FPS with SAX. Instead, there are a lot of ways to optimize that. Uh, one that is quite easy to implement, it's called instancing. And basically, what you're doing is, instead of calling the GPU in a for loop, you are preparing all the positions, all the data to the GPU, and you're uploading it all at once, drawing multiple stuff with a single call. And uh, with this technique, you can easily achieve 120 FPS and uh, even more. And that's one of the main optimization that made uh, uh, our tool, for example, to be possible. And uh, for example, uh, we need to uh, display a lot of, uh, uh, for example, the same uh, resistor 3D model over and over again, and a lot of different instances of text that says uh, the number and the uh, rating of that resistor. So you see that we have a lot going on. And we had to go even further, and we had to do some <laughs> magic shader trick to optimize how text is rendering. And the way that we did that is, is that we encoded the, the 3D models of each character, like A, B, C, D, each glyph in the font, uh, as a texture. Because textures are normally used to apply like uh, uh, an image on top of a 3D model, like if you want to make it look like wood uh, or wall or whatever. Images are actually just a, a very long list of pixels that are made by RGB components. What you can do is that you can use uh, those pixels to actually encode data. And if you look that you have RGB values, that actually maps quite well to X, Y, Z positions in a 3D space. So we use this kind of correspondence to store geometry data on a texture and then read it back uh, on the GPU and you see that, for example, here, each color corresponds to a different position in 3D, because it's y, uh, X, Y, Z. And in that way, we can uh, uh, very efficiently display uh, a lot of text uh, uh, at 120 FPS on the GPU. And uh, OK, so we went through a lot of examples on how to do that uh, for uh, uh, graphic stuff, on how to draw a lot of 3D models at the same time. But previously, we also talked about uh, uh, other stuff, such as uh, machine learning, uh, simulations. Uh, what about number crunching? Can we do that uh, with the GPU on the browser? We know that we can do that on the GPU on, uh, on, a, desktop, on a desktop machine, if you, are <laughs> if you have access to CUDA and to Python. And, uh, but can we do that on a browser as well? Well, the answer is uh, yes, no, like so far. Um, there is a very cool library called GPU.js that uh, takes that approach that I said earlier with encoding data on a texture and takes it even further by saying, okay, let's pretend that this texture is our way of getting data input like inside and outside of the GPU. So it's basically uploading data to the GPU via texture processing it uh, with a fragment shadering, uh, with a fragment shader, render it back on another texture, read it back, uh, and then interpret that data as uh, binary data that you, can, uh, that you can encode, for example, the weight of, m of a machine learning uh, model with it. And not only, it actually takes JavaScript code and it automatically transpiles it to GLSL, which is pretty ca crazy. And uh, there are some 
very cool examples like this one that runs the dice trial unit for pathfinding. And uh, this is like the implementation in JavaScript that then gets converted into GLSL and then, then executed. Uh, it gets executed very fast on the GPU. Uh, so it, it works, it can do stuff, but it does like a lot of limitations. You're very limited on the amount of input data and output data that you have. Uh, uh, like y it's not that fast actually. So we, we need a better standard. Like uh, recently a new version of WebGL called WebGL2 made the things a bit better. Uh, adding some new features, but it's still not ergonomic, it's still not fast, and you don't want to do that uh, right now. But, but, there is a new web standard right now called uh, WebGPU, uh, which takes the concept of uh, WebGL, that is very like uh, how we would do graphics in the 2000s, and takes it to the modern day. And uh, it right now it's unfortunately just uh, supported uh, by Chrome, and uh, if you want to use it on Firefox, you have to run it with a special flag. Uh, if you want to run it on uh, Safari, you can't because Safari doesn't support it yet. So like right now it's just Chrome, but it shows extreme promises. And uh, let's see a bit about what that's about. Like as we've seen, uh, WebGL, it's pretty much supported uh, on uh, every browser. Whereas instead WebGL, it's Chrome and, and Edge. Oh, edge only uh, for now, but we, like Chrome shipped it, so eventually it n will need to come on the other browsers as well. Uh, I still believe in that. Uh, another thing is that uh, WebGL, it's as I said, low level. You probably don't want to write it. Uh, oh no, WebGPU, it's even lower level. Like it allows you a way more customization, and so it means that uh, it you have to write more code and. Uh, you can customize how everything works, but it means that you take responsibility for it. And uh, one other thing that is, I think, pretty cool is that uh, um, WebGL uh, instance context is uh, strictly related to a single canvas element in the HTML page, whereas uh, um, WebGPU is entirely decoupled from the canvas. Like, you can uh, run WebGPU without spawning a canvas or use a WebGPU instance for multiple canvases at the same time. We couldn't do that before. And uh, they use two different sharing languages. One is uh, uh, GLSL uh, for WebGL that uh, we just talked about. And it's very similar to C++, whereas WebGPU uses a new language called uh, VGSL. That instead, uh, I mean, the primitives are very similar, but it's much more similar to Rust as syntax, if there are Rust likers here. And uh, another, like the most important difference is that uh, while WebGL is a very old timey API that is fixed and you can just customize the vertex shader and the fragment shader, on WebGPU you don't. You can customize pretty much everything. You can uh, like uh, even say that, uh, oh, I don't need to render anything graphic specific, just give me access to the power of the GPU. And you can just write uh, a VGSL code that processes a bunch of data and then uh, spits it out at incredible speed. So this means that uh, finally with WebGPU, uh, we have something suitable uh, for general purpose computing, uh, which is really cool. Finally, we can run uh, machine learning stuff on the web. And uh, I think that it's pretty much well shown by uh, this thing here that uh, shows a benchmark of performing matrix multiplication that is one of the fundamental uh, parts of machine learning. You can do that, you can see that the uh, WebGL, uh, like JavaScript alone doesn't scale at all. WebGL it's a bit better, but WebGPU it's really the way to go as by in increasing the data size it just keeps running and it just keeps working without crashing and without taking years to compute. And uh, so I talked about machine learning. And so how does it work with WebGPU? Well, of course somebody ported uh, PyTorch to it. PyTorch is a library uh, for Python that uh, was developed by Facebook Meta to do machine learning stuff, which is really popular because like, it's very ergonomic to use and it has a lot of examples. And recently someone just uh, exported it to, uh, to JavaScript. So now you can pretty much uh, use PyTorch even with the Autograd 
uh, on uh, on the browser, which I think is really cool. So you can um, train a machine learning model and then just import it on the browser, and it will work on the client machine. This means that, like, uh, um, if in the future we want to, like, we will surely have uh, much more powerful hard GPU hardware also on the client, and uh, we won't probably need to run it on a server like we are doing right now anymore. Because previously, what we did is that, like, we always, uh, uh, I mean, that's what we're doing right now. Um, instead of running it on the client, uh, we are every time calling a server that, uh, we, that the company is paying, that, that startup is paying, and then we are sending the result back to the user. Whereas we could simply uh, use the processing power of the user instead. And uh, why don't we try to do that right now? I'm going to go in front of the project right now. <laughs> And uh, I don't want screen mirroring for this. Uh -uh. Let's try it. So this is a very cool example called uh, Web Stable Diffusion, um, with which you can we can run the Stable Diffusion uh, uh, machine learning model. Yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, on uh, the Chrome browser, I'm running on a MacBook Pro uh, M1. And uh, let's try it. This is not running on a server. For example, here we can type a photo of uh, tech people listening to a conference in the mountains of Trento, Italy. Let's try to generate it. Now you would probably hear my laptop uh, screaming full speed uh, because it's, it's taking a lot of processing power to do this. But eventually, we will reach, let's see, 11 seconds. Now everyone is looking at the computer thinking. It's a marvelous process. OK. We should get some results. Or it crashed. That could also be a possibility. No, we are getting something. We're getting there. Okay, we are seeing some mountains. We are seeing the sky. That's starting to look like people. Uh huh. Yes, that's definitely people. Then those are definitely mountains. Yes. <laughs> that's very ironic because that's pretty much what's happening right now. People generating images with AI and getting praise for it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's all I have for, for you today. So if you have any question about this, just uh, feel free to ask me. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your presentation, and thanks a lot for, for coming all the way from Graz to, to give this talk, and for uh, you know, volunteering to, to come here. So anyone else who wants to give a talk, you don't need to come from Graz, you're already in Trento. Just uh, you exactly. know, send us a suggestion, and uh, uh, maybe you, you can be the next uh, speaker. Uh, so there are a few questions here. Um, a couple of similar ones. What happens if I open one of the websites that you, show, you showed earlier with the cool animations? Uh, on a 20-year-old computer without a GPU, and more in general, how do you handle, like in a in a program uh, in a in a website like the one you're building, how do you handle the different GPU hardware configurations, the different connection speeds? Uh, yeah, and that? that's interesting. Uh, like, uh, if you open that on a website without a GPU, I think that it should work in any way because there is software rendering. Uh, like that actually depends on the browser, but most of the time it should work. Um, and yeah, um, it, uh, like the hardware configuration matters. Fortunately, not that much because uh, um, like uh, it really depends if you're run running something that is very GPU intensive or it's more like a communication between the, G the CPU and the GPU intensive. Um, but like I think that those websites should all should actually work pretty well. Uh, like probably you opened uh, uh, Google Maps on uh, a 20-year-old ThinkPad, uh, and I mean most of the times it doesn't even work that badly. 
That's because like most of the times you have uh, available out of information about what is the GPU that the, the user is currently using and you can scale down, for example, the quality of your rendering based on that. There are a lot of libraries to that, so that's definitely doable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically your, your code knows a bit about uh, what's available and exactly. can adapt. Exactly, it's like, yeah. That's cool. Uh, an interesting question here, is it not the trend nowadays to delegate the power to the servers, to the cloud, let's say, and have only like, thin, stupid clients at home? No, that's what in, that was 2022, people of the... <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, yes, but we can't keep doing that forever because like, yeah, the cloud is fast, but you have latency. And when you want to have a, a large language model that answers you in 50 milliseconds, doing that on the server, becomes increasingly and increasingly complicated, especially if you want to handle millions of users. Mm. Yeah, good point. Um, what about the portability aspect of uh, relying on the GPUs? I mean, that's, I think that's similar to the other question, the one uh, uh, about uh, um, the, the rendering quality. Yes, you, like, but uh, if I don't answer that same question, if you instead talk about compatibility and not performance, yeah, there are sometimes problems. Like uh, you can go to a website, uh, I think it's called the webgl.info or something, with which it will tell you what are the capabilities of your hardware. Because for example, there are some older GPUs that are not able to load more than a certain number of textures or they have a memory limitation. Like already web GPU, uh, webgl, uh, uh, puts limits on what you're doing because it's not reflecting the actual hardware that you're using. But yet there are some limitations, but it's something that uh, you can most of the times get around with clever programming. Then unfortunately there are, there are some cases like customers with, uh, an, uh, and like with uh, the 2019 Intel MacBook having graphic graphics glitches and you can't really solve that because it's a problem with Apple not being able to write drivers. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there are issues there, but it's very difficult to solve them when, when you get into those kind of issues, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question that was here but disappeared. Um, w it was something about uh, why, uh, so what is still, it seems that you can do everything in the browser. What uh, is still only possible on a, on a native uh, application? Okay. Well, well, yes, yes. But, but I, 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 want, I was more, you know, I wanted him to elaborate. <laughs> if we're talking about the graphic stuff, uh, uh, I mean, you're still limited with WebGPU because like you have far bigger limits, but uh, like uh, if I remember correctly, you're still a bit limited on the amount of VRAM that you can use. One thing that you can't do on the browser, low latency audio. If you want to build a digital audio workstation, you can't really access the low latency audio. That's mm. an example. Cool, so Fede, no, no DAW for you in the browser. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, last question. Will I be able to play Crisis from a website? Oh, I think already. I think that if you take the, um, the Crisis source code, uh, that's probably in C++, and you compile it with WebAssembly, you should uh, be able to somehow run it. Uh, and uh, with WebGPU, you can, uh, Facebook recently published uh, a very cool uh, library. I don't remember how it's called, but it's like an abstraction layer over, web, uh, over um, Vulkan, uh, Metal, uh, DirectX, uh, web, GP, web GPU, and a lot of other stuff with which you can program it once and it will work anywhere. So uh, there are a lot of things that you can do. Like there are already a lot of games that are just being played on the browser. Cool. All right, there are, there are more questions, but as usual, you can ask uh, directly to him uh, uh, during the networking part. I know you're all very hungry and thirsty, so we will not keep you here for much longer. Thanks again, Giulio. Thank you for having me. <laughs> all right. Uh, then, as usual, we have a f some final, uh, some final, uh, <laughs> logistical information for you. Uh, so one, one thing that uh, you might not know, but if you're here for, for a long time, probably you know, yeah. uh, the bottles that, of, of the beer that we, we give you, uh, we want them back because we get money back if we bring them back 
to be reused and also reusing stuff is cool and helps the environment. So don't go home with the empty bottle, just leave it, leave it here. Um, don't even go home with a full bottle, leave it here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's next? Uh, clicker, clicker, yeah, clicker. It's yeah, gone. Clicker yeah. is dead. Okay. Um, also, the, our usual REST uh, API on REST ORing chairs. Uh, if you have the green chair that folds, fold it up and bring it over there. Okay, Let, let's go to the end of the event before this, but first, uh, before moving that, remember what I told oh. you, okay? Yeah. Got it? Okay, remember, I saw already uh, the number increasing during the event. I'm just telling you. So, <laughs> tomorrow get your ticket and, uh, yeah. We, tomorrow, we, tomorrow may be too late. Let's <laughs> wrap up officially the event. Good night, it's been awesome. Thanks for this season. And uh, we see each other soon in uh, September. So see ya on YouTube.